today about some of the research we're doing on pheochromocytomas and paragangliomas. Um, some of the slides are going to be a little complicated, and I know I'm standing between you and lunch, so we'll try to go quickly. All right, so I'm going to talk about first some definitions, which are going to summarize basically everything you've heard today. And then I'm going to spend a little bit of time about talking about what is DNA and what are genes before I get into the research. I don't know what everyone's knowledge background is, so I want everyone to be on the same page. So you've heard already that pheochromocytomas and paragangliomas are tumors that are derived from chromaffin cells. So what are those cells? They're cells in the body that are supposed to be there, and they make hormones called catecholamines and metanephrines. We need these hormones to live. They are the adrenaline in our bodies. The problem is that the tumors can make too much of these hormones and can lead to high blood pressure and rapid and pounding heartbeats and sweating and other symptoms that we've already talked about today. Some of the tumors don't make the extra hormones, but they still cause problems because they push on normal areas in the body. So it's like stuffing everything into a closet and trying to close the door and you can't quite do it. So it can cause problems that way. So some terminology I'm gonna use for the talk today. Um, Adrenal gland tumors, as you've heard, are the ones we call pheochromocytomas. You've heard that the adrenal gland sits on top of the kidneys. There's two of them on each side, one on each side of your body, two total. I'm going to call them pheos for this talk. The other tumors um, at other sites, which are notated in the green here, are the paragangliomas, so outside the adrenal gland. And then the ones that we refer to separately as the head and neck paragangliomas are the ones that are in the head and neck. Those tend to be the ones that don't secrete the hormone as much, but cause problem because there's not as much space in your neck and your head. All right, so why do pheochromocytomas and paragangliomas form? Unfortunately, we don't really know the answer to this. What we do know is that if you have a mutation in one of 10 genes, you're more prone to develop a pheochromocytoma or a paraganglioma. Those genes are what we keep referring to as susceptibility genes doesn't mean you will get this tumor if you have a mutation in a gene, just means you're more likely to get it. So what is a gene and what is a mutation? We're gonna do a quick genetics lesson, so bear with me for a little bit. Um, I just, as I said, want everyone to be on the same page here. Okay, so DNA. DNA, I love this picture, looks like a twisted little ladder. And the rungs of the ladder here are from four bases. We call them, think of them as blocks. Each block is abbreviated by A, T, C, and G, and they form pairs, as you can see here, across to make the rungs of the ladder. There's about three billion of these pairs that make up your human genome. And the sequence of these blocks or these bases matter because they make the instructions for how the body is going to work, okay? So let's try to understand DNA. Can anybody read what this says? It's difficult, right? You can't do it. Um, but if you know the code, you could figure it out. So this is Pig Latin. Remember when you're a kid and you take the first letter, put it at the end, add an A? That's what that is. So once you know, then it's a lot easier to figure out what it is. And the same is true for DNA. So with DNA, you need to know the genetic code in order to decipher what the message is it's trying to send. We break up the sequence here into blocks of three letter words, so to speak. And those words go together to make sentences or genes is how you can think about it. And each gene tells the cell how to make a specific protein. So basically the genes make a message, which is RNA, and that's translated the message into a protein. Proteins are the building block of our human body. There's tens of thousands of them that are needed to make up a human. Okay, have I scared you off yet with all the genetic stock? Hopefully not. There's one more slide that's a little complicated and then it'll get a little bit easier, hopefully. So um, we've talked about the fact that everybody can have variations in their DNA, which have little or no impact on our actual health, and we all have that. So the way you can think about it is if you take an American spelling versus a British spelling of a word. So theater with an ER versus an RE or labor without a U or with a U. It's the same meaning, but there's slight variation in how the word is spelled. But sometimes the variation in our DNA can change the meaning entirely. So in other words, it causes the formation of a damaged protein which isn't gonna work properly. So the example is if you take the word state and you replace the T with an L, it's a completely different word now, even with one letter that's different. Or if you have the word eat and you add an S in front of it, it's a completely different word. So a single letter variation here is making a completely different meaning. 
So the top one, where the meaning stays the same, we call those variations a variant in the DNA. For the ones where the meaning changes or the protein's gonna change, we call this a mutation. Okay. So we mentioned already the 10 susceptibility genes. I'm just representing them here by little blocks. Um, we've talked a lot about them, and I'm not gonna go into great detail about them, but just to point out that the NF1, VHL, and RET genes are the genes that, um, when mutated, can cause syndromes that have many other features besides pheochromocytomas and paragangliomas. But when those do develop in patients who have mutations in these genes, they're mostly gonna get the adrenal pheos and not any of the tumors outside the adrenal glands. Then next we have these genes here. They all start with SDH, you've heard of them, succinate dehydrogenase complex. So each of these genes makes up a protein and all five of those proteins come together to form a big complex that functions in your body. But what's interesting is that if you have mutation in just one of these three, the D, C, or AF2, you're more likely to get the head and neck paragangliomas as opposed to ones at other sites in the body still can get tumors at other sites, but more likely to get the head and neck ones. But the SDHB, remember, it's part of the same big complex of proteins, but if you have a tumor in SD, uh, excuse me, a mutation in SDHB, you're more likely to get tumors that are outside the adrenal gland and not necessarily in the head and neck, the extra adrenal tumors. These last three genes at the bottom here um, have just been identified as susceptibility genes in the last couple years, so their clinical relationship is still being worked out um, in detail. Okay, so let's talk really quickly about the research that we're doing at Penn on Theos and Paras. We are trying to understand the characteristics of all our patients who have these tumors, because if we can better understand that, we know what to survey, what to look for, how to help patients clinically. We want to figure out what causes them to form in the first place, because if we can do that, maybe we can help prevent them from forming and also develop better treatments once they do form. Okay, so um, in our cohort at Penn, we actually have a database of 302 patients that have had a pheochromocytoma or a paraganglioma, which is a pretty large number considering it's a fairly rare um, tumor. In our cohort, we have 60% that are female, 40% that are male, and then their tumors are located mostly adrenal gland, 43%, and then the rest are outside the adrenal gland, with 37% of the patients having head and neck tumors, 16% having extra adrenal, so again, that's outside the adrenal gland, but not including the head and neck ones. And then there's 4% of our group of patients that have tumors at more than one of these locations. Now there are patients, as you all well know, that have tumors maybe multiple in the head and neck, or more than one tumor in, in, in an extra adrenal site. But the multi-site are ones that where you might have a head and neck and an adrenal tumor, or a head and neck and an extra adrenal tumor. So there's less, that's less common. The behavior, um, most of them are primary. And I say primary, that sort of I mean benign. They're staying within their tumor little area. They haven't spread anywhere else. Um, but 15% of our group of patients have metastatic disease, meaning that it's spread away from that initial tumor site. These are some of the other characteristics of the group. Um, if we look at age of first diagnosis, how old are people when they develop their first uh, FIO or para. If you look at the total group, which is this first column, you can see that the average age is about 45 years old, but it ranges. We've had patients from four to 84 years old develop their first tumors. And then if you break it up by sites, what you see is that the people who have tumors at multiple sites are, tend to be much younger at their initial diagnosis of their first tumor. The other thing um, that is interesting, and we've alluded to in the other talks today, is that only about just over a third of our patients had high blood pressure or hypertension at diagnosis. So a lot of people think that that's the key to diagnosing is when people have uncontrolled blood pressure, but it's not for everyone. Not everyone presents with that as a symptom. The other thing is that just over 10% of our group of patients had a positive family history, meaning somebody else in their family had a pheochromocytoma or a paraganglioma. Okay, so what about the genetics of our patients? 
So we um, have done a study where we looked at all the patients who have seen Shana or someone else in the medical genetics clinic and have had genetic testing. Out of our 302 patients, that was 139. Um, out of that group of patients, 41% had a mutation that was found. So that's just under half of the patients who were referred for testing actually had a mutation that we found in one of these genes. You can see that SDHB is the most common one that we see, but then there's D as well, RET, NF1, and VHL, and all the patients who had these mutations had the adrenal-based pheochromocytomas and not tumors outside, whereas patients who had the SDHB and D had tumors that could be really in any of the locations in the body. But what's also interesting is that um, the majority of the patients still have no mutation that we've been able to identify. So that means they're either completely sporadic, as Shana referred to, there's no, it just happened by chance and it won't pass along, or that there's other genes we haven't found yet that may account for some of those uh, tumors as well. And then if we look at the genetics for the metastatic tumors, um, there were 33 patients in this analysis, and you can see that about half of them had SDHB mutations, but half had no mutation that we could identify. Okay, so knowing all the characteristics of the patients really brings up a lot of questions on a more a biological, molecular, genetics level. And some of those questions are, why do mutations in so many different genes cause the same tumor type? And why do some people with susceptibility gene mutations get tumors, but other people don't? And why do some people get malignant disease and other people don't? So unfortunately, again, we don't have answers yet, but we're working on it, and we're hopeful that we'll be able to come up with some of the answers. And the way, one of the ways that we're doing that is that we are um, doing a study where we're sequencing tumor DNA. So we're looking for changes or mutations in the tumor DNA, which are not in the DNA from the rest of the body. So this is different than what happens at your genetics visit. At your genetics visit, you're looking for a mutation in a gene that's in your whole body that might increase your risk of having a pheochromocytoma or paraganglioma. What we're doing now is saying, you either have that mutation we know about or you don't, but now I wanna look at just the tumor DNA and what happened, why did the tumor form? What changes are just in that tumor tissue that are not in the rest of your body? So these are not changes you pass along to anybody else. These are specific to the tumor type itself. Um, and we're hoping to do that because it might help us understand what changes cause, you know, what uh, changes cause the tumors to form and why some become metastatic. So um, some of you have probably been enrolled by Bonnie or Shana into this study. Some of you I've spoken to on the phone for enrollment for this study, and some may not have heard of it. So just a brief overview. It's an IRB-approved study, completely voluntary participation, so it doesn't have anything to do with your clinical care. This is just extra if you choose to volunteer for it. Participation means that you allow us to look at your medical records so that we can obtain some of those characteristics I talked about before. How big is the tumor? How old when you were first diagnosed? Different things like that. Is there family history? Was there high blood pressure? Then we also obtain a blood or saliva sample, and that's to allow us to look at the whole body DNA, and then we obtain tumor tissue. So if a surgery was coming up, if they had extra after they made their clinical pathology diagnosis, did their PASS score and all that stuff, if there's extra left over, we get a little chunk of that so we can do our research on it. Um, and then, it, in the past, if you've had a surgery before, some of that tumor after you, the clinical diagnosis is made is always stored in hospitals in the pathology department. And so if that's extra there stored, it would allow us to get a little piece of that as well. So, so far in two years, we've enrolled 134 patients. We have 25 tumors that have been collected at the surgery time in that two-year period. And then we have about 100 stored tumors that we um, can have access to. We have patients who have joined our study that have all different types of mutations, and we have some patients that have had no mutation we can identify, and then we've had some patients that have never been tested either. So then we do fancy sequencing stuff that I'm not gonna go into detail of, but you kind of understand what that sequence looks like from what we talked about before. We are gonna get that 
actual sequence, we're going to look for those changes in the DNA that we can find and see if those changes would change a protein, which means it would change the function of something in the body that might have caused the tumor to form or become malignant. So we're, our ultimate goals are to understand, again, why these tumors form, try to find ways to prevent them, and develop new treatments for them. And then just in the last one minute, I just want to tell you about some of the clinical studies, which is just a recap of some of the things that you've heard. One quick thing that we've done is you've heard about how radiation treatment is used. It's often used for the head and neck tumors most commonly, but we wanted to look back at our patient database and see how effective is it when we use it on tumors that are outside of the head and neck because it's classically not thought to be um, used for that purpose. And we found that it does seem to be pretty effective. I'm not going to go through the data, but just to summarize, that 76% of our 17 patients, when we looked back, that received radiation at some of these metastatic sites outside the head and neck had pretty good control at that site, at least for a year that we looked forward. And there's minimal side effects, as you heard. Another question we had, and you've heard a little bit about, is combining therapies. So can we combine MIBG with radiation therapy for better treatment of metastatic disease? And the answer seems to be yes, we're doing that more. When we looked back, we, there's many patients who have had both of these treatments, but we had five that had both of the treatments in a very close time period. And in those patients who were treated basically at the same time with both of these treatments, they seem to have stable or even slightly less disease at the site of radiation. So maybe combination therapy will be uh, very effective. And then you've heard about some of the new trial therapies as well, the Davitinib trial, which hopefully is opening very, very soon. And then you heard a little bit about, too, the MABG instead of MIBG. Right now, this is only in animal studies, but it's looking promising. And so hopefully we can take that forward at Penn as well into human studies. So hopefully I've gone through and explained a little bit about genetics, a little bit about DNA and mutations, and some of the overview of some of the research that we're doing at Penn. I have to say a lot of thank you. None of the research would happen without patients, obviously, so we're so appreciative. It's very interdisciplinary, lots of collaborations, most of these people you've heard from today. I also have funding from the NIH, but also the FIOPARA Alliance Grant. Um, which has been very helpful to do some of this sequencing research. And I just received the North American Neuroendocrine Tumor Society Award to continue forward with more of the sequencing research. So it's very important, and we thank all of them. Um, and that's it. Thank you very much.